their intent or mission may not always be the same as the value proposition to a customer, right? So we would have to teach them to like, okay, when are we talking about what you care about? When are we talking about what the customer cares about? Have you seen a shift in the last few years around how important that piece of your own drivers and organisational values and pieces being um, central in that way you just spoke about from a marketing point of view, from a people wanting to buy from and be associated with brands that care about what they care about. Are you seeing the mission purpose piece or intent, whatever word people want to use, becoming more and more connected to a value proposition or is that still something that's important to keep separate? I think my favorite entrepreneurs I work with are really good at holding both of those things simultaneously. So they're they're really quite driven by something personal and they don't always bring that up in terms of their, their marketing message with their customers. Um, but what it does is that personal mission is a really sustainable source of fuel and energy for delivering a really, really great experience or a really remarkable product to the customer. Uh, it, it can be quite tiring trying to constantly test and experiment and um, iterate on what your business actually does. And so what we often see is the entrepreneurs who are driven by something really personal, you know, both what they talk about publicly and even what they don't, that's what's going to continue to inspire them to, to keep refining that value proposition and to keep changing and improving what they do to boost their sales further and further. One of the pieces, Isaac, that came to mind, you mentioned some of the pieces around um, the employee ownership and in a podcast episode I did, I think uh, two or three weeks ago, there was actually some research that London Business School did around those companies that featured in Fortune's like 100 Best Companies to Work and their research showed that those companies generated 2.3 to 3.8 percent higher stock returns than their peers like there's all of these pieces that actually we have evidence now of these bits playing out in in the positive as long as someone i was talking to last week pointed out that with some of those best place to work you also do need to look at how long do people tend to work there? Because if everyone says it's a great place to work, but the average time they stay there is 18 months, well, maybe that's not a great example. So we always have to be discerning and looking at these things. Um, but I do think that if people have kind of questions or pushbacks to what could this look like, we are now decades and decades into many organisations going down this path. And there is precedent and there is plenty of, of examples of businesses kind of creating these win-wins. I, I wonder, do you have any favourite businesses, favourite business models and examples of, of groups that are doing this well in terms of integrating back into the business the contribution in some way? Honestly, most people are doing a dreadful job of this at the moment. Um, most large organizations who are trying to do this, they they really mark it up and they get the culture wrong. I see it so often with councils. I see it so often with government government departments, NDIS, disability support providers. They're doing a shocking job and they're having huge So turnover. maybe talk to us about that. And is, that's interesting though, Isaac, because the examples that you just gave there in terms of like big bureaucracies and stuff, the governments, councils, etc., is a, I would say a different group to businesses and more of a corporate lens to things. So talk to us about those common things. What are you seeing when it is done poorly and the culture bits are, are just not working because learning from what's not working is also helpful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, jump in and, and give us some of those examples. Sure thing. Everybody likes talking about innovation. Innovation is really, really hard. And one of the reasons why innovation is really hard is because people read case studies and stories from organizations where a lot of the people doing the work had a lot of creative control and they had skin in the game. And that's a really nice combination because there's a bit of optimism and there's a bit of fear. They work pretty well together in the right proportion. And the challenge is some of the groups who have a real aspiration to do this kind of work, where they go, we also want to become more sustainable. We also want to become more financially viable and impactful at the same time. They go, yes, let's also do this same thing. 
They miss those two criteria. They don't have creative control. The team doing the work doesn't have creative control and the team doing the work doesn't have skin in the game. But all that means is if you don't have those two things, you are usually looking for your, your boss's approval and your supervisor's criteria at all times. And that's gonna make you move really, really slowly. It's gonna make you second guess a lot of your work and it's gonna make you very hesitant to try things that might not work. When you look at business model innovation, all of it comes with risk. All of it comes from trying things that may or may not work, or it's gonna be the second or third or fourth version or experiment that actually starts to take off with some customers. Um, if you have a team where people feel that they are trusted, where people have some sort of skin in the game, be it financial, be it in terms of the direction of the business, um, they have a degree of ownership, you're creating the condition where they're actually gonna try things that your competitors won't do.